All right, Mandy, we're recording. You're good to go. Thank you. We're going to see if anyone joins us for exhilarating conversation today. So I'll wait 10 All or 15 right. seconds. I thought the agenda was kind of small, which was amazing. Is there any possibility we'll end earlier? We might. That doesn't come out of my mouth as chair very often. Okay, so we're going to get started and then I'll talk about the agenda. Um, uh, seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling this regular meeting of the Community Resources to get Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order on September 7th, 2023 at 4.33 p.m. pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by uh, Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote meets. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. We are also audio and video recording this. So with that, I'm going to take a roll call to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard, and that will also serve as our attendance roll call. So Pat. Uh, present. I surprised her because I should have started with Shalini under the <laughs> alphabetical. Shalini. Present. Thank you. Uh, Mandy is present. Jennifer Tom. Present. And Pam Rooney is not here right now. I don't, I'm not, I don't think she will be here. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't think she will be. So, um, but we'll watch just in case she's, she decides to come. Um, with that, we our agenda, uh, Pat was commenting that it might be slightly sparse, and it may be. Uh, the one thing that we were going to have on the agenda originally was a hearing on the opt-in specialized code. And so one of the reasons it is sparse is because that was pulled from the agenda um, before we needed to post the hearing, uh, because Anna and Jesse had indicated that they will not be ready with answers to the questions and ready to present. They needed a, a bit more time. So we will be doing that in two weeks instead. I had Athena post the hearing um, today for the hearing in two weeks. So that sort of cut our agenda down and nearing the end of the term, we are nearing uh, completion of our referral items. So we're going to um, take some time for two of the items, one item on the referral, the other one is the specialized code, and then continue discussion on the AMAHT meeting um, follow-up. I watched the last CRC meeting, so I am at least up to date on what you all discussed last time. I thank Pam for running that meeting in my absence. Um, and But we're going to spend the bulk of the time on nuisance house slash nuisance property will take public comment um, probably before, but we'll see when we take it, but it will probably be sometime in the middle of the meeting, not after all of our discussion and, and action items. Then we'll do the minutes and everything, and maybe we'll end early today. Um, so last meeting, y'all made it through a, a second or third review of nuisance property. Um, I've got basically the document as it ended um at the last meeting we can pull that one up but after watching the video uh i took i i modified that document to try and clean it up based on everything you talked about um and so we could pull that one up too um if we wanted to see what it all looks like modified for what you talked about last time um we can pull that up after we go through the rest or before um, based on those conversations. And then there's a few things I want to go back to because I wasn't at that conversation and I want to bring some stuff up. But then I want to talk about with Nuisance, if we make it through everything, uh, what our next steps are for that? Because we had talked early on about robust um, public outreach and all. So I sort of want to talk about where we are with Nuisance and, and where we're going. Um, and then we'll move on to the AMH team meeting follow-up. Uh, questions or thoughts at this point before we move to nuisance? Pat, you're muted, Pat. Sorry. Um, I was going through this and, and uh, we had already talked about the snow and ice 
um, I believe it's section um, 2B and then also C6, um, where we refer to, uh, I'd have to find it. Um, yeah, like in uh, section C, there it says snow and ice general bylaw 3-4. I that kept bothering me, and this is minor, so I I don't want to waste our time. But it isn't somebody. We kept it snow and ice first because we thought that would people would find it easily. But just the title doesn't refer to anything else, and I think we've expanded that bylaw. So I think it should say removal of snow, ice, and other obstructions from sidewalks, which is it is what the bylaw says. And we need that at least once, because then you could have snow and ice and other obstructions or something. Uh, but I would not know that, um, you know, that I might have need to clean up my sidewalk because people can't get by or something like that. And yeah. I, I said it's minor, but it really kept bugging me. Um, yes. So I have put up the document you guys created last meeting. Um, mm -hmm. It might be worth where you got all the way down to um, this last part here is where it was indicated to start, which is the second half of the corrective action plan process for nuisance properties instead of problem properties. And then one thing on state law not preempted. And so I wonder if it would be better to see, because you're referring to, sorry about all the scrolling, but you're referring to this section. Yeah, that's why, yeah, here, we don't have to do, that, we don't have to do it now. But. had a lot of changes and moving around because of different things. And so it might be better to look at the version I created in response to all of those comments that corrected those names and, and things like that. Um, and so I pulled this one up. This is the one that was in the packet. No one's seen the other one because I did it yesterday and figured we'll have time to, to review stuff. But it was it was basically a, an attempt to re clean this up based on that conversation. So let's start Amanda, with that. Think, it, it would have been good when you finished that to have sent it to us because I would have had time to look at it. Yeah, I... And I, I, I need it to be it, bigger now. No, I will make it bigger. I finished it late last night and knowing we had a short agenda-ish, I figured yeah. we'll go through it. This will not be the last time we're seeing. I don't, even though I moved it to action items, I don't intend to vote today um, okay. because I think we need to send it to make sure like okay. Rob has seen it and stuff. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so I, I, I made that decision because I thought let's get everything in from everything and then we'll send gotcha. out to everyone, but we'll take the time to review it. So let me put that one up. Um, Jennifer, you had your hand up. It was not I just wanted to agree with what Pat said about identifying the bylaw. So, um, yeah, and we can still come back to it later. So I think it's this one. I have lots of stuff going. So this is, and I'm going to put it this way. Um, I'll I'll make it bigger to all the red lines refer to marked up version changes from the prior version. So there's it it looks a mess. Well, um, right now I can't see. I, I'm going to make it bigger, but if we do all mark up, you're going to see a whole lot of stuff. And so yeah, I'm yeah. going to show you the non marked up, the simple markup. So if there's a red line and you want to see what was deleted or added, let me gotcha. know. Expand gotcha. it, but um, that we're going to start down where you guys didn't get to last time okay. and then we'll, then we'll um we'll come back and start from the beginning again and catch okay. everything and i'll show you what that section specifically looks like thank you um so you'll see it looks a little bit different um than the last one but um you got through looking at notification and um, it said corrective actions or something. And so I've retitled it corrective action plan because that was, or correction process. And we've referred to corrective action plans. Um, and so this is the cleaned up. It nearly mirrors what we didn't get to last time, which is the nuisance property. What do you do with identification? Um, and 
then what is that correction process? So last time you talked about once it's a problem property, you notify, people meet, you put a plan in place, that plan gets implemented. And then what we, we're talking about now is what happens when either that plan is not implemented or whether there's another nuisance violation after the plan is implemented um, and so that the property becomes a nuisance property instead of a problem property. And so the, the two parts again of this are, there's the notification process. So once it's designated as a nuisance property, I, I did retitle what the notice is. So, um, oh wait, I, re I, I wanna retitle it. It's not retitled in this. It's one of my requests um, and my comments on this. Um, it's, it, and right now, based on what you talked about last week, it, last meeting, it would be that notice is that the property is a nuisance property now. Um, the, if it's a rental property, the permit, rental permit might be suspended, revoked, denied. The owners are liable. Um, and each day or portion of a violation, um, constitutes a separate offense. That's, that sort of mirrors what the last notice included. And so are there comments on the notification? So this is what the notification includes um, section. And I will raise my hand, but I'm happy to hear from others first. I have a couple requests. Um, I gotta find the right section here. Um, I would like to retitle the notice from notice of a public nuisance and violation to notice, notice of a violation and designation as a nuisance property. So it would look notice of violation. Um, it would look like this, just the title of what the notice is because you're really notifying of a violation and that it's a nuisance property. So I, I thought it was just a clearer title. Yeah. Um, and then I would put an and or between owners and person. Well, actually, no, I would not. Now that I think no, about it, it should be both. It, it should be both. There should not be an or there. Um, so that's correct. And then I wanted to talk about section C and D. And I wanted to add a section. Last meeting, you changed section C to notice that the owners are jointly and several liable for all subsequent violations of a public nuisance um of the public nuisance bylaw well no hold on oh no that one's an easy one it's not public nuisance bylaw anymore it's nuisance property bylaw yeah. um i had a question about the one year or current lease period part of this notice, it, it appears throughout all of the bylaw about when, how you're accruing things to get up to or, or counts or points, however you want to call it, to get up to being designated a problem property or a nuisance property. And um, right now they all say within one year or current lease period. And I, I would prefer to delete the current lease period. I would like to hear what people's thoughts are. But when I think about it, a lease period isn't necessarily a year. A lease period can be six months. A lease period could be two years or three years. And so to me, including that actually um, is less clear about what you're counting from 
for the three or the two or the extra one than if you just say within a one year period from the date of the notice or from a specific thing. So I'd like to hear thoughts on why the current lease period was in there. Jennifer. Hmm. Um, I don't know why it was in there, but I, I like the year because the current lease period could be two weeks. Hmm. That's right. And so a year is actually, I think, I think that's better. So. And I agree with that. Shalini? Yeah. I think Shalini's just thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm still in the process thing. I was just worried current lease period would mean, you know, in some sense, it makes sense if we're saying nuisance property from the, if it really is a tenant issue, um, the if tenants just moved in and and someone calls them for having a gathering in the backyard of 20 people for a birthday party and the prior tenants had had five, the current tenants are going to end up causing that designation as a news or the prior tenants has had three. And so this one, even though it's there first, it goes back to nuisance property. So you could argue that might not be fair to the tenants at the same time, you know, and so counting it as only the current lease period potentially of that. But if you've got a tenant, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's too vague current lease period or too changeable depending on who, um, it, who a tenant is. If you own a property, it's always one year. If you're a tenant, it might be two weeks. It might be six months. It might be two years. It might be that. It doesn't seem equitable. Pat seemed to support it. Jennifer seemed okay. But Jennifer and Shalini was thinking. Oh, yeah, again, I like the one year. <clears throat> I mean, okay. I'm just, I know this is very... Uh, what's the word empirical I'm just going on one but like I'm thinking of one house in my district that was would have been a nuisance you know if we have this and there was a the last weekend of the school year there was many uh dis disturbances so um there are now new tenants but the property manager is really determined not to have that again, even though it's new. And so I think by keeping it a year, it just it is a good thing. Um, but again, I don't think it needs to be more than a year if you have a three-year tenant. And this, yeah. And I, I don't know whether we need this phrase here, the now jointly and severally versus are now are liable for all subsequent violations at the property. Are they, they basically mean the same thing, right? Oh. Uh, or because, because jointly, or so you jointly can just. So they might not mean the same thing. Um, Jointly and severally would mean, I think, would mean one ticket is written and it's paid, it's due, it, it's written sort of to the tenant or the owner, but there's not a ticket to the owner and a ticket to the tenant, mm -hmm. it's just one ticket. Whereas if we don't include it in there, I, I don't know whether that would still be the case, but maybe there would also be the case where you can have two actual tickets, one for the owner and one for the tenant, say, if they're different. Um, so it might expand the ability to write different tickets for different people, but I don't know the actual answer. I would just be curious whether if we delete it once the attorney reviews it, whether they add it back in or not. Like. Yeah, because they would see the deletion. They might if we keep the marked version. 
we would probably clean it up for them. But they, even without it, they might say, you know, it has to be joined in several. Thoughts on that deletion? It is simpler just to say libel for all subsequent violations. Um, but not being a law person, I'm not sure. Jennifer. I was going to say the same thing. Not being a law person, I don't um, appreciate the new one. <laughs> no, so tell, I mean, what what it's saying that together or separately, they're responsible. Sort of. I mean, my understanding is it's if there's a $300 violation written, all five people say, if there are five people, five people have to pay a total of $300, not each of the five people pay $300 separately. And so that $300 can come from one of the five, or it can be from five of the five split up. So so think of a a rent. If if we think of leases and three people are on a lease, every single one of them is responsible for making sure the rent each month is paid in full, even if they have their own sort of separate agreement as to how they pay it. Well, if one person doesn't pay it, the other two still are responsible to make sure the full thing is paid. And yeah. the and the person and the owner can go after just one of those three for any back rent. They don't have to go after all three. Is my understanding of what join in several means. They could go after all three, or they could say, you know, these two I don't have a shot of getting the payment from, so I'm only gonna sue one one of the three tenants for the money. I was thinking I'm 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 still struggling a little bit with it, but I was thinking, what if I weren't even there? I'm a tenant. I'm not there. My other two roommates throw this party and, you know, why should I be liable for something? I wasn't there. I was out of town. I didn't plan the party. I didn't participate. So the way you stated it, it seemed like you could give me a ticket too because I'm on the lease. And that feels a little unbalanced or unfair um, jennifer but aren't we talking about the owners here here Both. we're talking about the owners when we get up first into the who's liable section we'll be talking about all of them together in a sense but here we're talking and and this language was not used up above when it said for a problem a property you know on the person's liable section for a prob problem property here's the five people liable it didn't say jointly and severally no. and, and so right now it is the land and the person in charge yeah. i read that so but wouldn't it let's say there's a, the police are called you know because there's a party or you know it's gotten out of hand wouldn't and in pat's um example if one of the people on the lease is not present wouldn't they not be part of the police report and then they wouldn't be held liable it depends on how our person's liable section is written probably okay yeah that's what, what i I'm would agree with pat if you're not there yeah if 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 that's doable we should make a note of that when we circle back which hopefully okay. we'll get to today but this language was not used up there so one thing would be deleted mm -hmm. for consistency purposes too everyone okay with the deletion I think so, yeah. yeah. My next question was on section D, and this appears above too. Um, normally, this part is under enforcement, not right. You know, if we think of what this is listed under, nuisance property notification. So this is this is not this is sort of notifying someone that oh each day it exists, it constitutes a separate offense. I don't know whether we need to notify someone of that, but the one thing I saw missing was up here where we talk about the penalties, 
that sentence was missing. And mm. so either way, whether we want to notify an owner that that is the case, I think we absolutely need to add it into the enforcement section to make sure it is the case. Um, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think so. Yes, agree. And so the question becomes, is that something we want as part of the notice itself? Um, or not like when the town sends in a letter to the owners what do we want in that letter that's what a b c and d are well then definitely they need to know that each day something is you know going can constitutes a it's separate brewing. yeah so not telling them that would be really unfair Okay. And one would think provides an incentive to correct the problem quicker. Right, yeah. Okay. And then I thought something was missing. I, I don't have, I just, my bigger thing was put it up above to make sure it's actually part of the, the enforcement. Um, what was missing in my mind of this notice was actually what they have to do when they receive the notice. So down here in number four is, a, you know, says once they get the notice, they have to contact and schedule that. But the notice, we never tell them that in the notice. And that seemed like a omission to me. Like you get this letter that says, okay, you've got a nuisance property, your permit may be expended and you're it, it suspended if you're a rental property, you're liable for all subsequent violations. And that goes on day after day until you fix it, say, but it never, but then that's all they have. And so I would, I, I suggest adding another letter that says this, that the require that they have a requirement to contact the town, schedule a meeting and submit a corrective action plan. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the letter includes here's what you got to do sort of thing. Right. Anything else with section three here? We will move on to section four. So this one was also one I had a bunch of changes to. Some are easy, some are not. Um, I I would retitle it correction. Are you talking about G now? I'm talking about four, this four here. Oh, okay. I would retitle it nuisance property corrective action plan. So what is, one thing I noticed in reading this was we don't actually talk about really what the plan is required to have in it and what that process is. It it got deleted from one draft to another. And unfortunately, I think Pam was the one that in rewriting this this way deleted that. So I'm I I we can't ask what her thoughts were on some of that deletions um in in renaming it, but we really do never say here's what a corrective action plan includes and and for this one we have to remember that the nuisance property already has a corrective action plan in place because they were a problem property right, right. and so what are we doing with that corrective action plan um so maybe the title is fine a correction process or um oh manager here needs changed to person in charge it's just a yeah mm -hmm. a miss thing there um and then this was and it says take all corrective actions to address issues at the property and then um and then there was this phrase which may prevent 
from being renewed. So here we don't define what corrective actions are. And that, so, so I sort of wanted to rewrite it to talk about a, a revised corrective action plan or to implement and to revise a, the corrective action plan that already exists. I, I don't know what the correct thing is. Um, yeah, this would have really been good to look at. Um, no, I, I know. I, 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 and I know. I'm not I know. sure we I don't have, have the right to, language. Yeah. I will say I'm not sure I have the right language. Um, I can put up my language if you would like to see what I did with it. Um, but I basically said, you have to, you know, this contact to schedule a meeting within three days. Oh, the and I thought should be a two. Because this says contact right. the town and schedule a meeting within three days. I don't know whether the town can themselves follow a three-day meeting if the meeting has to take place within three days. Yeah, I thought it was just to schedule it. Yeah, so I would change this to two to schedule the meeting. You got to contact yeah. them within three days to schedule. Yeah. Um, just this minor word thing there. And that and then, would have to be business days because the town's not open. Yeah. Right. And and the three days under our charter becomes three business days. So we don't have to yeah. set that yeah. forward. But then, okay, so they've got this meeting. And I started thinking, what happens at the meeting? Right? You've scheduled a meeting. And what are you doing at the meeting? Mm -hmm. Right. This one basically says the town's going to direct implementation of acceptable corrective action and identify a time frame. But that's it. Are we? And so I thought, is the corrective action plan that's already been approved being modified or what what's going on? I tried to think about what's going on in the meeting. Okay, it's a person shall contact the town to schedule a meeting and to discuss the property. And that where it says take all corrective action, um, it, it may me need to say something about the creating a corrective action plan. Who, who's not, that's not the right, corrective action or uh, to address the issue, you know, blah, blah, blah. Where is, oh, right, because they have one. They have one. So right. so I had come up with like modify the corrective yeah. action plan. Yeah, that's good. And I like the issues at the property, which may prevent. That's good. That was there already, I think. Yeah. So so then I, I talked about in in A, a revised plan should be discussed at the meeting and then uh, and I I'll I'll put language up, but what happens with that revised plan, who accepts it or not. So in prior drafts, we had had that the town has to approve the plan. Um, or if it doesn't, it submits changes to the plan for revisions that then they have another meeting. And so I was following some of that, but um, with submitting of subsequent thing, but once the plan is approved, the, a prior draft said that the plan was binding and this one doesn't really say it. Uh, so I would have added that back in. And then the other thing I, I thought about here was, okay, well, we had a corrective action plan. They still had a nuisance. We're back to a nuisance property. So what if they don't do anything with the corrective action plan or how do we show that they're implementing it? So I suggested requiring after the revised plan was adopted, requiring additional meetings with the town to ensure its implementation. Dalani. Uh, can you remind me if we agreed, I'm sorry, if we've already agreed on this, whether it's the, like, for, for, problems that tenants are causing like the noise and the garbage or cars and all of that and is it the responsibility of the tenants or like here i'm just reading it's all the manager or the owner but did we actually decide that 
and whose responsibility it's going to be. And I know that jo uh, John, before leaving, had said there was a problem in holding the tenants responsible because they don't have the address or they don't know. So, but I, I'm not sure. I just can't remember what the conclusion was because right now we're just moving forward, assuming that it is the responsibility of the owner slash manager. So I just put up what my suggested sort of process was. To answer Shalini's question, I think that's where we're struggling because of what John says, right? At what time does, some nuisances are owner responsible, others are not, right? If we look at the list and at what point do the, the and, 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 and th these conversations have been focused around assuming that there is an owner that is not living there, right? But nuisance properties can occur in owner occupied, Anyone can have a nuisance property. You don't have to have a different person creating the nuisance than is the owner. Um, they don't all just have, like rentals are not the only places we have nuisance properties. But um, assuming there is a difference between an owner and the person creating the nuisance, what we've heard from John is the inspections department can't cite anyone but the owner. The police can cite whoever's there because the police have the authority, I guess, to ask for ID or something. I, I don't know why there's that difference, right? Um, and so at what point, the question becomes, at what point is something that has been happening repeatedly by someone who is not the owner at the property, at what point does it become the owner's responsibility? And that's where I think these different problem property, nuisance property designations come in and trying to say, you know, after a certain amount of violations, it becomes the owner's responsibility. And the owner has to find a way to figure out how to talk to the non-owner individuals who are creating the nuisance and figure out ways. What these corrective action plans might be is regular conversations if they're tenants regular conversations with the tenants and the owner and the town right like we don't know what the plan might be that the town and owners come up with but i think that's where the owner might be getting the ticket from day one if it's inspectional services from violation one we don't know jennifer yeah i think be at the point it becomes a nuisance it it should be the owner should have a big responsibility. I mean, initially it's if the police are called out because there was a party or um, it's going to be, you know, they're going to be dealing with the person who's on the premises who, if it's non-owner occupied, the owner in all likelihood won't be there. But by the time it gets to this point, the property owner, you know, we would hope would have intervened. <laughs> So I think at, at, you know, that at the point at which a property is, you know, again, it's a pretty, doesn't happen overnight that you become a nuisance property that the owner sh should be very much, or the property manager should be very much involved. I mean, if you were renting out a house, you would get involved at, what, at the point it got, you know, to this point, if you're a responsible owner or property manager. Well, so yeah yeah so i agree with you um uh, jennifer i just think in the implementation there are some practical problems that such as that like we're saying that if there are three such uh problems right is that what it is and then it becomes or whatever okay but anyway the implementation problem is like there are a lot of problems in so let's say the land, uh, the owner wants to does try to intervene and reprimands the tenants hey don't do that or whatever right and but they still don't do it and then the tenant's like okay i'm not going to renew your whatever but it's still going to be you know they're still within caught within a cycle so, uh, so they have to finish the rent the agreement and even the, yeah so during that time period we is it fair to 
put the responsibility on the owner. Especially, I'm, talk, I'm thinking like the smaller landlords who have a few properties and it's, is this too cumbersome for them? Jennifer. So let's say it's a situation where it's not necessarily noise if it's, mm -hmm. you know, litter on the front lawn or, you know, right. something like that. Junk then, vehicles. Yeah, it yeah. would be the owner's, you know, the, it might entail the owner coming every week and seeing what's going on. You know, so I think the owner needs, you know, you hope that the tenant would, mm -hmm. if they're cited for having litter on the lawn, would correct it. But I think if it's chronic, then it, you know, if I was the owner, I would make regular checks to the house and make sure it wasn't happening. I wouldn't just say, well, it's up to the, my tenant doesn't do it, mm -hmm. but what can I do about it? Because they can do something yeah. about it. Is that easier for a small landlord to do? It's certainly easy for an owner occupied and a lot of this stuff doesn't happen in owner occupied. But is it easier for a smaller landlord to, um, it seems to me like it would be. Like if I have three apartments across the street or down the street, it's pretty easy for me to know what's going on even with, you know. Where it's a little problematic is if you live mm. in another state. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole sh other schmuggy. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But we want to deal. Yeah. I mean, didn't we hear, though, that I think it's the bigger companies that actually have management companies. For them, it's easier because they send their management crew to go and do the cleanup. I thought it's the other way around, that it's the smaller landlords who can't afford these management companies or and are going to have to go and pick up the stuff themselves may not have the bandwidth to do it. And I don't know, like, I mean, it's like we're making assumptions without really knowing. Yeah, so I raised my hand to think about, We've heard a lot about condo restrictions for those that might have renters in condos or owners in condos, say. What if a tenant of a condo does the littering or an owner of a condo mm -hmm. just litters their entire thing, something? Maybe the condo association would be what takes care of it so it never actually gets a nuisance property, right? Because, because it's just paid for there. So maybe it's not an issue for those situations. Um, but I guess that's where the corrective action plan and the meeting with the owner might, it owner and or property manager, right? And we now know meetings don't have to be in person per se because there's video conferencing and also even if the owner's out of state to figure out what the appropriate response is to try and prevent more calls and more public safety responses from coming in, right? I think that's the goal of the corrective action plan. And then when we've got to this point where that didn't work and there were still calls to our public safety officials and responses from them and still violations that are being cited. And so maybe what we have to do is trust that that plan will take into account what is doable under each if it's if it if there is a tenant under each lease if it's an owned property if my property is the one that gets cited four times um who knows what the corrective action would be right like can can the town or does the town just keep citing me and i just keep racking up 300 dollar violations because i refuse to do stuff right but there's no eviction process that the count town can do with me there's no owner to evict me because I am the owner, you know? And so what would the corrective action plan look like in something like that, removing a junk vehicle? Well, if I'm happy yeah. getting the citation instead of it, they can't really force the removal. It's on my property. They can keep fining me. So, right. I, at least I feel like that's the case. It's a violation of the bylaw. So I if I'm happy to pay the $300 a day or whatever it is, eventually I'll oh. probably move it, right? Because it's cheaper mm -hmm. um, if I own the property. But it, if I choose to just pay the fine, so I think we have to have a process 
And then maybe what we have to do is leave and trust that the people involved in the process will come up with individualized plans that work for whatever the situation is. Jennifer. Oh, sorry, I muted. Um, you know, like one common situation is sometimes happens at the beginning of the year, you know, people might move into a house and there's been furniture left over from the year before. So they'll, like there was one house in my district that they literally had four double mattresses and box springs <laughs> just on the side. You could see it from the street for more than a week. So um, someone called John Thompson and he called the owner of the property and they were gone, you know, in a few days. So I don't, you know, so somewhere between the property owner or manager and the tenants, they got rid of it. But if, if they did, if the tenants were to say, well, we don't have any way to move it. I do think the owner is responsible at that point, even if he may have to charge the tenants for moving it or whatever, but it's not the, the owner is res ultimately responsible. I think. Um, and then Pat. Pat, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, I I don't have anything that important to say, but um, it seems to me that the scenario that you presented, Jennifer, you had tenants moving into a space that hadn't been cleaned out. So that seems to me to be the landlord, the owner's responsibility, not the tenants. Um, and, you know, I don't think they should be fined for stuff that had been left over um, from right. another. But now it may happen. At, yeah. It, maybe the landlord thought he was doing them a favor, but, but yeah. Yeah. But it's, right. yeah. Yeah. And so, I do think the landlord probably paid for it. Yeah, well, I don't know. But yeah. one of the things that Mandy said that sort of, it, it's like creating a, a minimal process that then the details of the implementation of it get set by the town official and the landlord tenants or whatever. Seems reasonable instead of us trying to anticipate every solution. On a whole other note, and I'll be real quick about this, I'm getting, I'm learning more and more about what some of the larger property managers do um, that is uh, uh, to charge tenants for uh, uh, out of security deposits that aren't so legal. And at some point we're gonna have to look at some of that town-wide, um, but that's a whole other issue. Melanie? Yeah, I was just wondering if it's helpful to include the tenants in some situations in this. Like, you know, if uh, the tenant knows that they're going to be called, there's some sort of fear then of them like coming to the authorities and having to talk about it. So I don't know if you, if any other town does that or is that doable? Can you repeat that, Shalini? I was saying that, you know, when they have that meeting, uh, and we're saying it's with the owner slash manager. Where is it? Should we also include slash tenant? Like, wouldn't it make the, uh, especially the younger tenants more responsible if they're being called to have be part of those conversations? Or is it, I mean, it is making it more complicated. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm right, not sure. right now for, problem and nuisance properties, we only send that notice and that requirement to meet to the owner and mm. person in charge. Okay. Yeah, no, no, and you've got mm. a great point though. Should the tenant be involved in those meetings? Should we be sending that notice of, hey, you've now had three violations. You're living in a problem property to a tenant too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, like may, maybe it should be to everyone, not just an owner, if there is more than an owner living at the property and any, you know, occupants mm -hmm. of the property, um, hmm. something like that. And then, so we could just potentially add in some of these, um, it would be, I think not under correct, we, we would add stuff into corrective action plan, but under the notification, um, mm -hmm owners, persons in charge, and any non-owner occupants, if any, or something, or mm -hmm. but we, we come up with the language, something like that. Uh, Jennifer, I think, Pat, your hand is 
residual. That was first. Or is it, yeah, Jennifer. Sorry, I forgot to bring it down. Oh, oh okay. I, I'm sorry. I just, another antidote, but just, I think, you know, and people are trying to work this out on their own. I was last week a meeting of like 12 student tenants that had just moved in and net residents on the street and the property manager. It was a great meeting. And one, one of the neighbors said, because they're in previous years, it, couple of the houses had been a real, real issue. Like, you don't know, like the, the furniture, just the tenants just move in. If they're particularly students or just here for a year, they may be the first time they put their stuff out thinking it's going to get collected by the guard, by USA and it doesn't. So this homeowner said, I have a truck. I have my, whatever permit he has to go to the dump and dump large things. He goes all year. When you need to throw something big out, call me. I'll come pick it up. We'll drive it together. It won't cost you anything. You can use my, you know, I'm just saying people, so I just thought that was great because it's not going to get to the town now. Yeah. So there's hope. <laughs> Felony. I mean, just an added point to that, and we heard that in the surveys and so forth, is there's a lot of confusion amongst tenants, especially, but also res uh, year-round residents with respect to these bylaws. Like what I heard was that tenants don't know where to throw like they don't know what the rules are clearly about so they just throw stuff outside and so and that's why I was suggesting that instead of them having to go and find the bylaw that it has it needs to be part of the appendix or something with this so that all everything is in one place I mean most people don't even know what the noise bylaw time is is it 11 o'clock is it 10 o'clock so and many people don't even know that there is such a thing so having everything in one place so they can, that's why we should put that um, as an appendix in this. So I would say I worry about an appendix um, because bylaws change. And so if you, uh, you're then essentially copying a bylaw within twice in, in the book of bylaws, right? Um, you know, this goes into a book of a hundred plus pages of bylaws and this one would be 3.26. Snow and ice uh -huh. is 3.4, five pages later, you know. Um, and so what we could potentially ask is when, if this is adopted, when it is adopted, that those referenced bylaws be added okay. with hyperlinks within Hyperlink. the document, some other part of the document, maybe. Mm. Since we're not working with the final document, we can't really do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But maybe we could suggest that the town clerk hyperlink amongst the documents, amongst the bylaws to get to the right ones or to the zoning bylaw. When the zoning bylaw changes, that document changes though, right? That's that's part of the problem. And so even hyperlink links go dead when we're changing stuff regularly but mm. maybe there can be some sort of link that way instead of, if we restate it, it becomes a part of the bylaw. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Okay. So, but it sounds like we might be will, able to move on. The question I have is, um, um, what I've got listed here, this was my sort of proposed changes for this. Does that, seem logical to everyone to incorporate into sort of the next draft of this bylaw. Um, this, what the corrective plan is discussed and then what, when things get submitted and next meetings and how often after a plan is adopted, they have to meet. Shalini. Oh. We have a member from the participants who have their hand raised. When are we doing the public comment? Um, we'll do public comment as we get through at least the final part of what we didn't get through in nuisance property next last time. I want to get through the first run through in a while of the whole bylaw, and then we can okay. do public comment, and then we can come back to the rest of the bylaw. Does that sound like a plan? Mm-hmm. We're almost done this first run. There's only state law not preempted after this. Um, I just want to know whether I should put these changes into the working copy of the draft bylaw. 
I would be comfortable with that. Let me put the draft bylaw back up and I will. Okay. Uh, give me a second and I'll get it in there. Um, the next section is the state law not preempted. I don't, there aren't any changes from the last draft. Do Does anyone have any suggested oops, changes um, to that? I'll fix the uh, labeling later. There we go. Any requested changes to that section? So we're gonna stop the share before we go back to the next section. Um, and move on to public comment. Um, let me get that up. Uh, general public comment on matters within the jurisdiction. We'll come back to, we're sort of pausing nuisance property right now. We're going to come back to it. But general public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC will be accepted at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, we generally do not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Of course, since we'll be going back to nuisance property, it may come up in our discussion on agenda items. Um, with that, let me find my Zoom. Um, if you would like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn. Um, sorry, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself, state your name where you live and make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard, Justice Drive Amherst. Um, thank you for bringing up who is responsible. Um, in the nuisance bylaw, you all keep writing about owner, person in charge, but not tenant, even though tenants may be liable. Suspending or revoking a permit for tenant behavior, that it, is a bit unreasonable. And Jennifer also said that uh, there were parties in the neighborhood and landlord doesn't want it to happen again, but really owners may not have control over it. Um, let's say the tenant is starting a lease and they start being a problem. You have a whole lease to go through and eviction takes a long time, especially now that you know the state is pausing uh, evictions again if, uh, if you apply for um, rent assistance. So you might not even be able to evict a tenant who knows? It can take forever. Um, litter, cars on lawns are also a resident issue. Landlords can remove trash and build a tenant or pass a violation fees onto tenants if they are liable and, and their lease specifies it. Um, and lease, leases usually say tenants are responsible for their guests um, unless people are trespassing. So you have, they have to prove that the people are trespassing and not just staying over and even though they're not present. Um, yet really punish the people that are responsible, not the victims of the action. And correction meetings should include tenants if the tenants are responsible, why not? Um, also colleges should be involved if tenants are off campus students and provide academic consequences for them. That could go a long way, could help a lot. Um, and you mentioned condos. It, I, my rental is a condo. Uh, I used to live in a condo for 15 years um, and now it's rented. So when there is a problem and the tenant, say, puts furniture outside or whatever, the association, the, the manager of the association will bill the owner uh, because that the contract, the association contract is with the owner. Um, which is different than a town, I guess. But um, so if I get billed, 
if I get called, I contact tenant and say, hey, remove it. And if they get, if I get billed, I can charge them because my my lease says that if I get fined, they will reco- I will recover if it's it's their uh, responsibility. Um, but when you think like security deposit, it is a very iffy proposition because Massachusetts is very very finicky about security deposit. Um, if a magistrate determines that uh, it was not uh, warranted for me to charge a tenant, I will be penalized three times that amount, um, which is, you know, very protective of tenants. Uh, and that goes for any kind of complaint, even Board of Health or, you know, if it goes to housing courts, uh, tenants are very much protected. So, um yeah, I hope that gets, you know, taken into consideration on this uh, nuisance bylaw. And if you have owners that live in the property, it's owner occupied, and and th- those are the ones that are causing the problem. They are ultimately the ones responsible. Um, so why not make the tenants responsible too? Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Renata. I see no other hands for public comment, so we are going to close public comment and move back to um, discussing nuisance house. We're going to do this for another twenty-five or so minutes, um, and then and then we'll see what's going on. We have made it through the first round, um, so I am going to put back up on the screen now the document that I, I know it's too small, give me a second here, that I tried to create to show, uh, to clean up all of the changes y'all discussed last time. <laughs> and, and cause you had a lot of comments of, oh, we need to revise this to look like this. I forgot to do one thing with this. <laughs> um, and so I, I tried to take all the comments that were written in the document instead of having the comments there, turn that into the language that the document would look like. So so that that's that's this document. And and yes, Pat, I, I did I did it yesterday. So it's it's not like I've sat on it for a while. <laughs> but I figured we were so close to the end that we could go through. I had some things I wanted to show we could go through and then we will distribute one big one for everyone to really review closely. And maybe we'll send that directly to public safety officials and and Rob and all um, through Paul on, hey, we're looking at big changes. Can you read this and and look at it type thing? Yeah, and I'm not accusing you of doing something terrible. It just would have, today, I had enough time I could have really looked at it and it would have made, so um, thank you for your work. Don't misunderstand. No, I, I totally get it. And I, I debated, do I send it? Do I not? It's really late. Um, Next time, not- send it. <laughs> yeah, next time I will send it no matter how late it is. How about that? <laughs> okay, it's a deal to uh, <laughs> So having gone through it, um, we've got about 25 minutes. I had some things I wanted to, to come back to and sort of circle around back to because I was not part of the conversation um, last meeting. I don't know whether we want to do that. Pat wanted to see the one section on where we list the the things that could be considered a violation that could create a nuisance property or a public nuisance. Um, So we can start there if we want um, and then come back to some of my questions um, that I had. Shall we just start there? I I guess that that's section B. Um, it, It becomes section B. So we'll start with section B. Um, I left comments in about the town manager. I've left the comment in of, hey, is there a schedule? That was one of the comments from Mm -hmm. last week. So that comment box is, is is there a schedule? Um, Just just so we didn't lose track of that. Um, So for section B, let's see how much of it I can get on here. And if people want to see the the full track, let me know. Uh, It's just messy at this point. (laughs) <laughs> so it's easier to read this way. Um, I had a question about section. So so there was one thing with a comment that's in here. The second comment box is um, the 
the includes but is not limited to pam had written in the last draft um already ticketable by law enforcement may not need to be listed in nuisance bylaw but should be reflected as violations associated with property tenants managers and owners so this is one of my questions i have for further discussion we don't have to do this one today um what is a public nuisance you talked about it last time and the, the thing's been modified. Um, but as we go through and think about this, the conversation last time struck me as focusing on sort of, uh, there, there's something later on about calls for nuisances. So noise calls, noise this, report the noise calls, report the noise this. But a a violation is only if you write the ticket. Someone can report and call inspection services for anything and there might not be a violation. So what are we, as we get down to sections about what is, should things be reported online? What are we reporting online? Calls um, about properties or actual tickets written? And I bring it up here, um, because I worry about the new definition of public nuisance. Um, last last time, Shalini looked something up and there was a discussion about quiet enjoyment, just enjoyment, peaceful enjoyment. And I think Shalini, you came up with something that used the word interference with some sort of enjoyment, right? And interference didn't make it into this. It says substantial disturbance. Um, I don't think public property should be on here because um, I'm not sure. Oh, and, and uh, who do you contact if you get three public nuisance violations on public property? Is the town creating the public nuisance, right? It goes back to almost this question about who, who's responsible, right? right. Um, um, so I would delete public, but I wonder if it should be substantial interference, but that still is a lot of leeway and who decides that interference? Because if I hate my neighbor because we just don't like each other and they hate me, any mowing of grass I might call a noise complaint in. Does that, you know, and the cops aren't going to write a ticket, but does that noise complaint show up on the town thing as we get farther on? You know, but who I assume I assume the police wouldn't write a ticket for that, right? You're mowing your lawn, right? But but what what it goes to what constitutes a substantial disturbance and, and what got deleted a couple of weeks ago was that 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 question that Pam had, is it within a certain number of people complaining or what? So I I wanted to revisit the definition. Jennifer. So I, I just wanted to ask, was the thing about public property, if um, someone lived near a park and there was, you know, you can, a, a disturbance that was beyond what, you know, you might normally expect in a park or if they were in a park after hours, but I guess then you, maybe the park doesn't allow people after dark and that would be the violation. I'm just and thinking. And that noise violation, right? You know, this is, this is, I, I, I think... What's the difference between the writing the ticket for the noise violation versus writing a ticket for nuisance property, right? In a public park, you'd write the ticket for the noise violation. So what yeah, point so are you thinking to write a ticket for nuisance property? Right, because what makes it a nuisance property, one of the things is if there's a lot of noise complaints and you've written up the noise complaints. I mean, you've, so written, could, you've written a ticket for the noise, and then if it there's it gets to a certain point, then it be in the same property, then it gets to be a nuisance. So, but in right. terms, if it what if it's on the common or suites or park, and it's a group of people and they keep coming back, is are we? Are well, we somebody might complain, right? If they live near the park. Yeah, but are, they're right. not complaining to a landlord. No. Then you just make a call to the police, right? Like if yeah, somebody's having a fire in a park, you. Yeah, there's yeah. So it seems to me that in this. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, no, no, Pat, Pat's got the point because okay, as this is written with the public property on here, and and it goes back to what are we trying to do with this bylaw, right? 
if if it sweeps yeah, right. group, it's five different groups over two weekends and each group gets th a ticket written well there's been three violations on that parcel on that piece of property the town owns it so the town's sending a notice of violation and problem property designation to itself to meet with itself to figure out how to manage Sweetster Park. By the way, this is written because public property is on here. Yeah, I know. Now, again, getting back to the lawnmower, if someone's mowing their lawn at two in the morning, but then that's a different, there's probably a violation just for noise at that point. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it be... Uh, Maybe public property does need to be there, and because you're sitting here or gross and lewdness. So if I'm running around exposing myself in Sweets or Park, I can get fined, arrested, whatever for lewd and obnoxious behavior. It is a public nuisance violation. So if if so, do we have to delineate? When we're talking about landlords and tenants, we're no longer talking about public spaces. Well, that's why I was wondering whether public property should even be on the list. But Shalini. It, well, it says public nuisance violations. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. in that category. I'm sorry. Right. Bill. Yeah. No, they can just to build on what you were saying, that they can't be nuisance on. But I think we need to maybe qualify beyond acceptable norms or something like we have concerts all the time in the parks and commons so that's not noise when people gather there but if people are honking or you know really loud music at 12 of the night in commons then they can be fined for that however it won't be it won't we won't pursue the nuisance property but they can still be the individuals can still be they're still violating a bylaw a noise bylaw Right. Or if, if people are littering, like, you know, substantially like just throwing away, they're doing a picnic and just littering the place, they can definitely be fined. So I think it definitely deserves to be there. Um, but not for purposes of property, nuisance property. Um, um, and then you would, we have that list, right? Like whether if it's litter or noise or junk vehicles. So I mean, that's, yeah, that's when that's this list here. Um, yeah, it, it split pages. So mm -hmm. um, I think I can. Oh, it defines what is considered a disruption of enjoyment of private or public property. That was not how I wanted to do that. I don't know how to get rid of that. So sorry. Um, yeah, so I think this is, we got rid of the point system where points accrue and then you've got these problem property designations, right? And I think we're we're running into what's a public nuisance and what's a nuisance property. And those are different things potentially. And maybe that's what we're struggling with as a committee on how do we differentiate? Because yeah, it, it, it a public nuisance does include that, but shouldn't they be getting the ticket under the gross and open lewdness, right? Why, why are we ticketing them under this nuisance property thing? And so... Maybe it's not public nuisance we're saying shall not, maybe we need to use a different term for public nuisance. Maybe it's just, maybe we need different terms there. Maybe it's just nuisance on a, I, I don't know. It's a clarification point. Yeah. What is the what is the title now for this bylaw? Because I had it as penalties nuisance. for violation of public nuisance, or it's, is it just property? property now we we've, uh, we've titled it nuisance property. At one point we said public nuisance yeah. because this is public nuisance here. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the other question I had is public nuisance number two here is basically a definition of what public nuisance is, but we're not putting it in definitions and, and that I wonder if we should be moving it up to definitions, but maybe we need a new term. And maybe it's not public nuisance, maybe, maybe it's just like, I don't know. We can mark it as come back and think about. Pat, you're muted. I just said uh, that would probably be good. Because it, it feels like a <laughs> real conundrum. Like we've sort of veered off of where our. Yeah. It's like we're trying to make goulash, you know, and everything is getting thrown in the pot or stone soup. Right. Yeah. Okay. Or if we could maybe ask Rob, will we talk about a nuisance on public property if it's covered under other vial, you know, other places, we don't maybe have to address it here. Which it does that feel like it be is. For the chief because the chief would know, because yeah. it, it would be covered under, much of what we're talking about would be covered probably under state mm -hmm. law. I wonder if there's a public nuisance state law. There might be. I mean, it gets covered under each specific separate one, right? Like for animals or junk vehicles. And there's a bylaw for each one of them. So for just general public nuisance, do we need to have it all under one? Or can it be just, can they be just fine under separate things? Yeah, and so I guess the question that I have then is back back to how this is working and one of the things that struck me in listening to your conversation on video was a lot of the conversation talked about, well, calls for calls, calls, calls without tickets being written. And at what point is a nuisance property ticket written? Um, because our enforcement scheme requires the tickets to be written three times before you get to the corrective action plan. Um, yet, if you're just writing them under noise and, um, you know, obstruction of public ways and snow and ice removal, you're not writing the nuisance property ticket and therefore you're not ever going to get to that corrective action plan which made me then think maybe we need that point system back about properties that have these laws set out with each time a ticket is written for these laws, then the nuisance property is when so many of those tickets have been written in a year or, or something. It got me thinking again. Oh my goodness, I totally thought that we we're going to be finding them because they're violating that trash law or that noise by law under this. But now I'm hearing you say that, no, they're going to be ticketed under that by law, but not. The way That's this is written now requires them to essentially be ticketed under this and maybe that, but maybe not. Reference. Well, wouldn't it because be like referencing whether or, is written, whether or not an enforcement action is taken under this that specific law by law regulation so so this says this this sort of says the officer if it's a noise complaint say or if it's well let, let's let's do a, a vegetation complaint no a false alarm we'll do false alarm so I, someone lives in an apartment building that's connected to the fire, automatic fire for any time a fire alarm goes off. Um, that alarm thing says after so many things, they can get a ticket for that, right? And so this thing, this this scheme says, if, if they wanna write a ticket, the police could write a ticket for false alarm then it wouldn't fall under this and it wouldn't count towards those three to getting to a problem property, or they could write a ticket under this one. 
because they've determined it's more of a nuisance property, or they could write a ticket under both. But only if they chose to write a ticket under this one, whether or not they chose the other method, would it count towards those three things to get us to the corrective action plan? <laughs> Pat. It kind of seems to me that this this goes back to, are we talking about public or private property? Um, I can do, I can break all kinds of rules on public property and I can get ticketed for it, but I'm not a tenant of that public property. But if I'm breaking rules on property, on whether it's rental property or property I own, or it, that just, it, it really, that's so different. And that seems to me that would trigger ticketing based on um, oh God, property. Oh, you know, so I, I guess I'm a lot of this has to do with people who rent property, but I could make all kinds of insanity on my on my property, right? And I could be subject to what? Uh, I'm going to be declared a nuisance house, but I own the property. I um. So what are we really trying to do? <laughs> because I think, yeah, what, seriously, what are we really trying to do? Jennifer. I mean, if, if somebody's, you know, leaving garbage or whether they're owner or not, I mean, I would, I would, if it were me, <laughs> I would, I wouldn't care. I mean, I, I don't even know that I'd know, but I, you know, I mean, I, I can tell you, I had an incident with an owner of a house right across the street and garbage was collecting <laughs> a lot of it. And we offered to take it, to clear it. I mean, for a long time. And then I finally, you know, this is on before I was on the council, had to call John Thompson. And when they went out, the number of um, health and safety violations were, you know, he said it was one of the worst he'd ever seen in terms of the number of categories and they had to deal with it. And it was an owner occupant. I mean, it wasn't so, you know, it yeah. was actually a, a, a fire hazard to the surrounding neighbors, it turned out, and to the person living there. So, right. so I guess, go ahead. I'm sorry. The question I have is, yeah, so, so that's a good example. I can, I, I can dump, littering on property is not exclusive to any type of occupant, right? It can happen anywhere with anyone um, and anything. And so if we use that as, as an example of a property that is not, that is just collecting waste because it's not being hauled away or it's not going to the transfer station or any of this, there's a violation. But what what ticket should be written, right? Is it the ticket under the littering and illegal dumping and whatever the state health code is? Or is it a ticket under nuisance property? Or is it both? Because I think one thing we recognize is all of that becomes a nuisance to the neighbors, right? And attracts, that's why there's health regulations about removing waste, right? And so, but at what point do we put it under this, if at all, versus just the John Thompson, you know, health and safety inspection services department under their health and safety state regulations? At what point are we saying, you know, you're going to get this nuisance property ticket too? And it all goes back to what are we aiming for with what is currently a nuisance house bylaw that relates to gatherings and underage drinking only? Shalini. Yeah, I think the, the purpose in my mind is to, uh, again, ensure that we have good quality of 
you know, neighborhoods and so forth. And so bringing all of them under the nuisance property by law, like you can cite that because you violated so and so, but it's ticketed within this nuisance property by law, it makes sense because that's the, I thought that was the fundamental goal for the people who initiated this is that in certain neighborhoods, especially more than others, there are more chances of having more parking or more. I mean, that's what we heard in the surveys was uh, there were a lot of cases where there was people were very happy, but then we also heard about a lot of cases where there was excessive cars outside on the sidewalks and obstruction or garbage on the, you know. So I thought th by making people responsible for this and uh, and therefore, I think in my mind, it makes sense to centralize it that, yeah, because you violated the noise bylaw, co you know, bylaw, da, 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 or this health bylaw, or this, or this, you get ticketed under the um, nuisance property bylaw. And then once they accumulate a certain number of points, then something happens. And of course, for the owners, I guess the I'll points just means they're paying fine. No, they're paying fines. They'll have to pay fines till they. Yeah, but there's no threat of what I meant was there's no threat of a rental permit being removed or right. anything like that. So the only thing you have is the ticketing. The um, fines. On the Actual yeah, fines. The fine. Yeah. So, I mean, if they're being charged $300 each time, I think it's pretty, I mean, we can decide what that amount is and all, but. Um, the other thing I was saying is that's the question that you asked, Pat, I think that's the reason it's good to have the purpose in the bylaws so that the people who are reading it kind of also have a sense just at the get go, oh, this is what the town is trying to do. And this is what, how we expect it to live is, you know, in service of the, this shared vision and values or whatever. So we should add a section on purpose. Jennifer. Yeah, and some of it is, you know, trusting our town, you know, building and safety. In this incident, incident, and John Thomas actually, and now we have Cress, you know, he knew he needed to get, she needed some social services. It was a case of someone who wasn't able to keep up her house. And he got, you know, the town got the care she needed. And now we have Cress, it would probably happen. You know, so they were definitely able you know, they didn't, they will treat eight cars on the lawn because whatever, and they know if it's maybe because there's more people living in the house that should, they'll deal with that one way versus someone where it's a completely different um, set of circumstances. You know, they didn't treat this person like a nuisance because it was a recognition that that's not what was going to remedy the situation and that this was someone with needs. So I don't know if that, but I, I, so I just, there should be a way that we can, we don't want to not deal with very frequent, you know, situations, which may not, you know, where that, you know, need to be dealt with, like you need to move your, somebody needs to get the couch off the front lawn, whether it's the tenant or the owner and someone who has a whole different set of circumstances. And our building and safety seems to know how to do that. It just, I guess it comes back to how do we write this? <laughs> right. as, as we struggle, how do we write this to capture the ongoing nuisance where it is ongoing in a way that is not easily correctable with just one visit to, you know, as Jennifer, her example is one visit and then connection with social services. And the problem in general is sort of revised, but how do we write a bylaw to capture when it's five visits and it still doesn't seem to be resolved for whatever reason, um, or it's five visits. And, and to give my other example, I'm happy paying the fine for junked vehicle because I just don't care. So, um, 
you know, and, and bringing in a different bylaw for that sort of thing to create another level of upping the ante as the case were, right? How do we capture it? We will get to continue this discussion. Um, but anyway, Pat, you're seeing how I rewrote this here. Shalini. Yeah, could we get staff feedback on that? How they think, yeah. because they have to implement it, what would make sense for them? Um, but I think could we at least people uh, that, who are closer to this bylaw, maybe write a purpose section. So we're all writing it in service of meeting that purpose. Does that seem okay, Mandija, to add a small, like maybe even if it's one line, seeing what the purpose is? Yeah, I, I put a comment up at a purpose. So, um, um, okay, and I think it's time for us to move on. If I may, you'll see there's a lot of changes here and all. I intend to, to make this easier to read, except a number of these. Um, but can I go through today? We eliminated the current lease period again. So shall should I go through and do that anywhere that comes so it just becomes that one year? I had also noticed there were some contradictions between some of the sections in timings and all. So if I can correct that before I send out a new copy, that would be helpful too and potentially speed up some of our conversations. Um, and then I'll send out a new draft that can also go to Paul for a lot of questions. Um, and then maybe one of, we can all um, try to look up other towns on how they write nuisance property or nuisance house or even public nuisance bylaws to see if we can find some examples of how it's dealt with in other places. Um, we know State College has something, but a lot of what we're trying to do, I think, is captured in State College's rental registration only um, with their point system. So um, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, but there's got to be others that have done it as two separate things because nuisance properties are not just rentals. <laughs> um, so um, with that, we're gonna move on if people would like. I wasn't sure, this one's still on here. Um, is there, I know the last conversation on the follow-up to the meeting, Shalini, you were, um, you were gonna work on, and it was not for this meeting. So it's not like you were supposed to have stuff here. <laughs> um, so, so don't, don't yeah, I, I, it, it, we were supposed to have a hearing today, right? And then we didn't. So um, um, you were gonna work on, I think Shalini, you were gonna work on um, bringing potential survey questions and all back to the committee for us to potentially create that survey. Um, and um, where are my notes on this? Um, that's the wrong notes, that's why. Um, and let's Not your question oh, yeah. about that. Did we sure. decide on that for sure that we're doing it given the time? And since we don't have Brianna to help with it and stuff, so I don't want to put in all the work and then not be able to do it. Pat, and then I'll try and answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're muted, Pat. I just wanted, because we're right at that place where C6, where it says snow and ice general bylaw 340, I think that needs to have the full title, which it or does. no, the full title of the bylaw is not just snow and ice. Yeah, let me pull it, it up. Is, it is something like. Um, yeah, no, well, let me pull it up to show you that it's there. It's. Uh, 
obstruction of public ways. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is getting really confusing. It, it's hard to read right now, which is why I would like to be able to accept stuff. I'll send you a track changes, but a clean version would be easier to read too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank um, you. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. So Shalini, to, to try and answer your question. Whether or not we can do the survey and start the survey now, I know I, I know we can't finish a survey in the next three months, right? Of uh, three and a half months. Um, whether we can start it or not, I don't know, but you know, CRC will continue on. Um, the AMAHT will continue on and planning with the conversations they're having continues on. So personally, I think it's valuable if we can start working on a potential survey that might gather information about the sorts of things the follow-up question was about, like focusing on what the 24 to 40 year olds and what they're looking for in housing and, and stuff like that. I think you know, that information, no matter when it's done, would be valuable. And so I'm not sure, you know, I, I think if, if we did some of the work, it might not get started this term, but it would give a head start to someone else, whether that be planning or when we get a replacement Brianna or something, right? We might not be able to launch it and all, but if we can have stuff kind of ready, that in my in my personal mind, I think that's a valuable thing for us to be discussing that won't go to waste. Um, of course, it it depends on who's elected and and where priorities are and everything. But I feel like the town talks enough about housing and housing affordability and attainability that that it will be useful to somebody, <laughs> whether that be the housing trust or the next CRC, or even just the planning department and planning board. Um, my thoughts, Shalini. I think to do it right, it would make sense to then coordinate with the planning board. If they have ideas, what have they been doing in that or at all? And if not, and they're like, oh, we're not even touching this or something, then that's fine. And then the housing trust as well, affordable housing trust, like what are some observations, questions, concerns they have, but I'm happy to start the process, at least like pull out. And actually we did initially, manager, you and I worked on, like, I don't know, we worked on, but we have a survey from the past, which we didn't end up using for rental registration, but that was, that did have these sort of questions like, you know, what What would bring you to this town? What would not bring you to this town? You know, stuff like that. What would you want to see? What stops you? What gets in the way of you moving here? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? You know, those kind of questions. Yeah, and I think if if you can hunt that one down, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And and mm -hmm. that gives us a basis to start talking. And then, yeah, last, last meeting you guys talked about reaching out to others right and if we we need to start with a basis of something though um mm -hmm. and know gotcha. what the goal is i think before we can sort of do that outreach that's my thoughts should i um, send it to you the survey and you'll reach out or do you want me to what is the process you, if you can gather because because what what i i i think based on last week's conversation and, and what I gathered from that is you would hunt those questions down. We would get that mm -hmm. into a document. It's not, you know, it might already be in like a word document or something. We can put that in a packet, it, frankly, for a month from now, we're not going to get to this. It, it might be on the agenda for two weeks, but we're not going to get to it because I suspect the hearing will be the whole meeting. Um, even though I threw some other stuff on the agenda, because you never know, sometimes hearings go what I expect, and sometimes they're unexpectedly short. Um, I don't expect this one will be unexpectedly short, but so I put other things on just in case, but we can get it into us. We can, as a committee, talk about stuff and then talk about who we would send it to, 
what we would be asking them and all of that, but we'd have a basis for our own conversation based on our meetings with the trust and our own, what would help us with zoning and housing and all of these conversations we're having, right? So I feel like coming to us and then we put it on our own agenda and then we figure out next step from there. So send it to me mm -hmm. and I'll get it in a packet. Got it. Jennifer. Yeah, this I just, just a, a, a question. In terms of getting, and I apologize if I missed it and you've touched on it, but in terms of getting feedback from people who don't live here, like what would keep you from moving here, what would get it, what would make you want to or be able to move here, would we get that information from like uh, you know, employees at UMass and the colleges and people that work in town? Do we have a way of who work at other places in town? So do we have a way to get mm -hmm. that was the goal? Yeah, yeah that is do. the goal to have this, you know, whoever the school, they have a newsletter or something like to use the school administration to send it out to teachers and staff and then to use UMass like we've done UMass, in the past. Like okay. Yeah. Or maybe the chamber or the send, bid could get it to their. Yeah. And the chamber and the bid. So use all the channels that we have right now established with within the community. Use those. And then not to forget what Pat did mention that to be inclusive, we will find a way to be at the mobile market or, you know, these other places, survival center or other places where we can uh, have the translated different versions of this. And we got to have. You got to figure out how we can do it most efficient, efficiently. Uh, you know, even if it, yeah, of course. So <laughs> if we can sit with iPads maybe or something and just have people answer it right there, or because it is a lot of work to even just to analyze it and then on top of it to feed like fifty pieces of information is a lot of work. And working with the survival center maybe and Craig's doors and all maybe possibilities yeah. to and have access to Amherst Family Outreach is another very good yeah. resource. Yeah. The language issue is present at the survival center as well. Yeah. Yeah. Churches and you know, we we might be able to figure out a way to to get it out there and and help with electronic more yeah, than or, but or I, I we could get volunteers cool. sorry we could recruit volunteers like everyone knows town counselors are spending a lot of time and then people who can support us who speak different languages maybe they can help with the translation or something like it can be done we have to have the intention yeah um, but we have to get creative yeah um the so the survey was one of the follow-up um items the other one was um and so we've got a plan we've got a month or so shalini for that one um for for production we're looking at the october meeting for that um fit into manager goals. Um, how do we put some of this into the goals? Goal setting will start at GOL and the council pretty soon for the next <laughs> term. Um, and, you know, we had talked about one thing we could do is find better ways to um, fit or, or to, to put manager goals out there for emphasis on affordable and attainable housing. And Jennifer, you were going to work on, I think from the last meeting, I had a note about you or Pam had said maybe that you could work on drafting some sort of potential goal regarding public-private partnerships or something regarding working with this university and colleges regarding surrounding staff housing. Um, and, yeah, to get, and, try and get, since so many... There's so many employees, particularly with UMass, it would be great if they could live here with their, with their, you know, if they have families with their families. Yeah. So some sort of goal rel relating to that. What other goals? I, I think for next time, I think we should be thinking about that one was identified at the last meeting. I'm trying to get us out of here on time. So 
we don't have much conversation, but um, I would like the committee to think about each individually, think about what other goals for the housing conversation that we had with the AMAHT, what, what would we potentially as a CRC be able to come to the council with of, hey, CRC thinks these should be some goals included in the manager's goals for the year, right? As as what others besides the uh, concentration on potentially staff housing where we work with the universities, is there other goals? So I would like each of us to think about that um, and potentially come with drafts of thoughts on what we could potentially put in or suggest the council put in as it relates to our conversations surrounding affordable and attainable housing. Andy Joe, would that be separate from the housing policy goals that are already stated in the housing policy? Yes. So um because the, the comprehensive housing policy has been adopted and there are five mm -hmm. goals and we're supposed mm -hmm. to be working our way towards it. The town manager goals though, one, you know, that comprehensive housing policy is huge, right? <laughs> and contains so much stuff. And so okay. potentially the town manager goals would be, you know, in the next year, here's that one thing within those five goals or two things that we want you and your staff to concentrate on, right? Mm -hmm. Like for okay. work in various levels. So, well, of course. Mm -hmm. so I see it more as the council's emphasis on what to implement within that policy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And I will make a note and try to remember to remind the committee before, and this will be for a month from now, two meetings from now. Because if we do have any time after after the hearing in two weeks, we'll go to nuisance. Um, because we're mm -hmm. that one's a little more discreet. I don't know whether we have time to get it done prior to the end of this council, but I think we can get substantial progress made. So nuisance will be what we go to, even though everything's on it. Um if we have time after the hearing. So this would be October something? What is the date? October 5th. Oh, my dad's birthday. Uh, but I actually found the survey. I can send it to you right away. So we can yeah, send it to me and I'll it. get it into a packet in yeah. my note taking so that when we create that, that mm -hmm. meeting is there. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that is everything but minutes. Does anyone have any requested changes for minutes? See none, I'll make the motion to adopt the August 17th, 2023 meeting minutes as presented. Second to Angelus. Are there, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we will vote. Uh, Pat. Aye. Shalini. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. And Mandy is an aye. That is four to zero with one absent. They are adopted. I will. I will take that on because Pam has normally finalized them. So I will finalize them. Um, I don't have any other, I guess the, I've made the announcements. The hearing on the specialized opt-in code is on the 21st at 435. It will be the main item. We will only do any other things on the agenda um, other than public comment. There'll be the hearing comment and then there will be general public comment at some point. Um, because it is a regular meeting. So those two will definitely happen. Um, everything else will only happen if the hearing completely finishes early. <laughs> so um, we'll see if that happens. I don't expect it to, but 
but that's the, I, I think the hearing will take the full meeting. Um, we'll have a more extensive presentation um, on that, and they have the questions that we had from our first sort of intro. So that's the plan for the next meeting. Um, so that's the announcements and the next agenda preview. I don't have anything anticipate unanticipated. Does anyone else? Seeing none, thank you all. Um, I'm getting you out eight minutes early. That's not <laughs> as early as I'd hoped, but eight we'll minutes. Take it. minutes. <laughs> We're adjourned at awesome. 6.20. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.